I'm making this video before I make the one on calculating the regression coefficients because that's not as important from my standpoint for social sciences and psychology researchers. You need to be able to understand what these coefficients mean much more than you need to be able to calculate them. So let's get on with this. Um, it's not quite as hard as you might. The big coefficient we always interpret, this is the biggest one, is b. Why? Because b is basically r. B is the correlation coefficient, just unstandardized. So a standardized correlation coefficient um, is R. An unstandardized correlation coefficient is B. We standardize it so we can compare coefficients to any other uh, research study or anything that we want, but we leave it unstandardized so that we can understand what's going on in our particular regression analysis. It's the slope of the regression line, which is a way of determining the strength of association. We sometimes say rise over ones, run, so um, for any given section of the line, how much change in y there has been, and positive, it's a, if it's a positive change, negative, it's a negative change, divided by change in x. And when you divide, it always reduces it to 1 on the bottom, right? So any number is that number over 1. So if you have a slope of 3, it means 3 over 1. Or if you have 3 over 1, you can just say 3. So the slope is always this many y's for 1x. So divided by means per, or for each, or for every in mathematical terms. So as I just mentioned, for each one unit increase in x, so one step going left to right on the x-axis, b is how many units change there are in y. If it's negative, then it's reduction in y. And if it's positive, it's increase in y. And the number is the number of units changed. <coughs> so hoping this shows up for you. Um, here's a regression equation here. We've got y hat equals 109.47 minus 13.93x. So interpreting that b, let's look at how that works. Let's just take one section of the line. Let's take a section of the line that is exactly one unit left to right on the x-axis, because that's kind of how the interpretation goes. So that's one. From one to two is one point. This is a GPA versus test scores type thing. So left to right. One point is from a 1.0 GPA to a 2.0. doesn't matter where we start. We just have to go one unit. So change in x is positive 1, always. When we're interpreting b, always think one unit left to right in x. So the question is, how much does y change? So over here where we start interpreting things, on the y-axis, that's 95.77 doesn't really matter where we start. We just have to keep, keep track of it. And it goes down this much, down to 81.84. So the line drops from 95.77 to 81.84 over the span of one x point. So when you go this way in one, on one x point, how far do you have to drop for this negative y here? Well, it looks like the change in y is going to be negative 13.93. And that's it. That's b. So there are, th y has to reduce 13.93 points, 13.93 percentage points on a test for every one point increase in x. So we would say for every one point, for every additional one point increase in GPA, we expect um, a 13, almost a 14 point reduction in test scores. So there is the intercept, and you notice the y intercept is in a crazy place. It's up above 100. You can't get above 100, but that's okay. The math doesn't understand that you can't get above 100, so we put it in there anyway just to describe, because you need that number to describe the line. So if a person could have um, a zero GPA, then we would expect that they would have a 109.47 on this test. I don't know what kind of crazy test this is where it's negatively correlated with GPA, but there you go. So that's an example of how to interpret things. And our, our phrase for interpreting, if I said interpret B, you might say something like, for every one point increase in x, we predict a decrease in y of 13.93 points. And you would put in the names of the units of those particular variables. And you'd say instead of x and y, you'd say for every one point increase in GPA, we predict uh, on average a student will have a decrease of 13.93 percentage points in their test, their test score. So b equals 0.47 means there are 0.47 y's for each x. So every one x going up is almost one half a y going up. B equals 15.90 means there's 15.9 y's for each x. 
So an increase of 15.0 nanowires for each one, one unit increase in X. Negative 312.5 means a decrease of 312.5 in Y for each additional X. Now this is just what the line does. This doesn't mean that's what the data really does. This is just our model. We're still just in describing the line. We're describing the model. Remember the model isn't reality. The model is something that we hope approximates reality. We later we'll get into seeing how good the model is and how well it pro approximates reality. So if X is the mean number of hours that a student reports that they study per day in college and Y is their GPA, then we might get data like this, which I totally made up and isn't real, and it's fake. Looks pretty good. So the best fitting line might be right through there, and that would be our regression line. I calculated that out because it was fun. Y hat equals 0.244x plus 1.8, or we could say 1.8 plus 2.244x. What's B? It's 0.244. So every hour increase in studying, so for each in their average studying per day during college, we would predict 0.244 increase in their GPA, like a quarter of a GPA point mostly. And then the, um, the y-intercept is 1.8, so we predict a GPA of 1.8 for a person who doesn't study at all. Kind of pathetic that you could still get like a D, almost a, almost a C uh, average for not studying. But that's what you get when you make up data like I did. You get fake data. So let's just kind of have a graphical representation. Here's a one-step increase in x from 0 to 1. Change in x is 1. You see the change in y was 0.244. You went from here up to here, a quarter of a point. And that works all the way along. All the way along everything. No matter where you start, if you go up by one point on X, you also go up by 0.244 points on Y. And X happens to be hours of studying per day, and Y happens to be GPA. So every one point increase, or one hour increase in studying on average per week, or per day, we would predict a quarter of a GPA point, 0.244 GPA points increase for the average student. And then you can see that this, that's the model. The model doesn't describe all these points perfectly. It, it's not bad, but it doesn't seem perfect, so we could talk about that later. So this is kind of a template for how to understand, um, or how to construct a statement interpreting B. For every one, and then put in the name of the units of the variable you're talking about for x. Increase in, and then put the name of the x variable. There is a put in the, the number for B, and then, the, num and then the, the name for the kinds of units of y. And then you do increase or decrease, depending on whether y is positive or negative. I know there's lots of different words you can choose. This isn't the only way you can do it, but this is a good place to start if you have to keep something in head. And then in the last word, y, you put in the actual name of the y variable. So let's practice. Um, predicting grade point average from number of hours studying per week. You've got to keep in mind, you've got to try and guess which is x and y. b is 0.03. So here are your four choices. I'm going to pause for a couple seconds, then I'll give you the answer. Okay, here comes the answer. For every additional hour studying, we predict GPA to increase by 0.03. Is the correct hour there? Or is the correct answer there? Now you can kind of guess because the number makes sense. 0.03 increase is probably more reasonable than 0.03 increase in hours studying. Here's another one. The number of hours TV per day predicts the number of aggressive acts per day. B of 0.87. Okay, I'm going to tell you the answer now. Hours of TV day does the predicting, so this is X, and the number of aggressive acts is going to be Y. So, oh wait, I didn't give you the possibilities here. Okay, now I'll give you the possibilities. There you go. For every one hour increase in TV watching, we predict 0.87 more aggressive acts. It's okay that we took something unitary and discrete like an aggressive act and we made a 0.87. It's silly in reasonable term, terms there, real world terms, but it works with the math and that's what the regression equation says. The regression equation just needs to tell us what the line looks like and the line doesn't always get described with little whole numbers, so we say 0.87. Here's another one. The number of calories that a person consumes per day is predicted by years they've been living with a diagnosis of anorexia nervosa at the time of assessment. Okay, here's the answer. This is predicted by, so this is why, 
so the number of calories consumed per day is Y, and years been, they've been living with a diagnosis of anorexia is X, so years since, it's trying to say years since they caught anorexia, or since they developed anorexia or something, but we don't really know much about, about how that happened historically when we see a person, so we say years of living with the diagnosis. Um, if B is negative 287, then the answer here is fewer calories consumed per day. Now, cons interpreting A is a different issue. A is the y-intercept. It's the predicted y-score if x was 0. And sometimes we care, but sometimes we just totally don't. Um, so when do we interpret uh, B? <laughs> just a second. I think I screwed something up here. Hang on. Okay, it wasn't too screwed up, but I did get rid of that beta 1 business from the textbook. I'm really not going to use that, interp that uh, terminology in this class. So when do we interpret B? I'm going to take a step back. I'm going back to B here, which is the problem. One of my slides was out of order. It's important or desirable to interpret B when the units are easily understood. So uh, units like dollars, hours, pounds, miles, um, GDP money, um, I don't know, rank in football championships or something like that. Often the, the units are not easily understood and in psychology that's very common because the units are the results of some questionnaire and you've seen that on in our data. You have these crazy units, these weird numbers like okay so what does a 243 on the questionnaire about self-esteem mean? I don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody cares. We care mostly, well sometimes we care, but mostly we just care how that relates to other things, not what 243 means. So when the units are easily understood, we interpret B. So in psychology, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we do something different. Sometimes we look at R instead. It's much more common. And then when prediction is important, whether we um, are interested in B or not, when we want to actually use our equation to predict, which isn't all the same either, then we want to interpret B. When the units are abstract or arbitrary, like in a lot of psychology Likert scales questionnaires, and when prediction isn't what we want to do, then often we don't bother to interpret B. Like I said, regression isn't something you always do all the time. It's more like a toolbox, and sometimes you use this tool, and sometimes you use that tool. Now, interpreting A, a bit of a different question. It's the y-intercept. I already went through that slide. Um, twice. We need to think about whether interpretation is useful in a particular situation. And I can't answer all situations for you. Uh, if you're going to do regression analysis, you'll run into a bunch of situations, and you just have to sit down and think. Does it make any sense? Should I bother interpreting A? Often we don't. It's less likely that we're going to interpret A than that we would interpret B. The slope is basically the correlation coefficient. We're very interested in that. The um, y-intercept is often really not very interesting to us, but sometimes it is. And in deciding this, we have to decide whether whether the x equals zero point even makes sense. And if it does make sense, we have to understand what it means. Now, and then we have to wonder if we care. Now, sometimes zero is the lowest point on our scale, but sometimes the scale can go below zero, or sometimes the scale starts above zero and there's no possible possibility in the scale to even have zero. If zero is in the scale, sometimes that zero is a meaningful number and sometimes it's not. So these are things to consider. So for instance, consider Likert data. It's often scored one through five. One is strongly disagree, two is strongly er, is disagree, three is neutral, four is agree, and five is strongly agree. There's no zero. So what does zero mean? It doesn't mean like you disagree even more than strongly disagree. You can't really make that statement. You didn't ask your participants that. Likert scale data is a little sketchy in some ways anyway, so you don't want to extrapolate down to zero. So zero this is not meaningful at all. Um, so that's an example of how we want to consider zero here. So here's a, a regression example. Let's say we're taking high school GPA as the x value, or the x variable, and the mean is this and the standard deviation is this, college GPA. Here's the correlation between them, a moderate correlation in social uh, science terms, 0.39, about 0 0.40. If you want, you can calculate the regression equation from just these values. You should be able to get B and A from this. And I'll give a second in case you want to do that. You can also check with R, which is much faster. So this is from the support data, so I'm just going to check with R. I'm going to do a regression analysis with this code right here. And then I'm going to do summary of the output. And I'll show you some of the output here, the coefficients part. 
there, there are the coefficients right there. You've got all sorts of information there, and you need to know how to extract the information uh, from these coefficients. This is the intercept. It says intercept, so that's easy. But right here, these are the coefficients. Those are the values. Now, this stuff over here is for testing those values with hypothesis tests. So if you want just the values themselves, it's this right here. So the coefficient for nothing is always the intercept, and the coefficient for the x variable is b, because that's the number that's attached to the x variable. This is x, and this number is attached to x, so this is the coefficient of this. And this is the coefficient of nothing. It's the intercept. So um, those are the two values that we use to figure out the equation. You just run this in R and then extract those two values. There's the equation. That's all I did. Predicted college GPA is 1.81 plus 0 0.38 times high school GPA. So here you go up here. This is a scatter plot of these data. High school GPA, college GPA. There's your line of best fit, your regression line. And here's kind of a breakdown for every one unit increase in um, x, which I did wrong. Hang on. All right, let's try this again. I hope these little mistakes I make are educational for you because you know, it's not like I'm going to stop making them. But maybe I could re-record this video someday now that I've got it right. So for one unit increase, now this is actually one unit. Now we're going from 2 to 3. That's one unit. 2 to 2.5 was not, not one unit. For one unit increase in x, we have 0.38 increase in y. So high school GPA, one point GPA increase in high school GPA predicts uh, about a third, um, two-fifths, four-tenths, 38 percent. So 0 0.38, not 38 percent, a 0.38 increase in GPA um, for college. Now, this here is the intercept. Where is it? What's going on here? That's right below 2.5. 1.81 should be way down here. What's going on? You can probably figure that out before I click to the next slide. This is what the data should really look like if we put zero on both axes. This is one way to lie with data, <laughs> not include the full range of, of data on your axis. So this is what the data should look like. R and many other software systems will helpfully shrink down the graph to only show the data that is seven, something like that for high school. So um, R shrunk it down and only showed you this section here. But the real zero point is down there. So it's even more confusing because zero isn't up against this line. You have to look at the axis. That's where zero is. So it does make sense. If we were to extend the line all the way down there, that would be the actual zero point. And there it is. It's just below 2, so that's 1.81. So that's what the graph should really look like. So that's one example of interpreting a zero point. You have to remember that in this case, nobody actually got zero. So it might not make much sense for you to say if GPA in high school. Well, you can't graduate from high school if you have a zero GPA, right? Plus, there's so much empty space here with no data in it, you start to really wonder, is the line really going to continue? Or would it go like crazy, assuming that was even possible. But I don't think it's possible to graduate from high school if you have a zero GPA. So here's another tricky example. X is right-wing authoritarianism from the punishment data, and I'll give you the data. And Y is religious fundamentalism. These are just some questionnaires given to people. We've talked about them a little bit in class. A relatively strong correlation between them for social, social science terms. Uh, you can calculate the values of the equation if you like, if you feel like that. Um, you could cheat and get them from R, which in about three seconds I'm going to do. Okay, going to show you some R stuff in a minute. But first I want to show you what the survey looks like. Now, it has a lot more questions in it than this, but this is what the survey looks like. This is one, I one item. Laws have to be strictly enforced if we're going to preserve our way of life. These are the response options. It goes from very strongly agree down to very strongly disagree. Nine options. The middle is zero. The author of this test chose to make the disagree items negative and the agree items positive. Zero is not on the left. Zero is in the middle. It is a meaningful point, but it's not the low point. And so keep that in mind when we look at the data. We add up all this stuff. We add up the answers to all those questions. But, uh, but zero will still be in the middle of the total possible range because negative answers are negative and positive answers are positive. Or well, disagree answers are negative. So if we run the regression analysis on this, 
then we should get these answers. So if you do the same thing, you should get answers that are identical to or similar to this. You can, I tweaked the punishment data set a little bit before I gave it to you guys, so I hope I used the same one. So see if you can figure out where the coefficients are that tell you um, what the regression equation is. Well, here's the equation, and there's the coefficients we found. There's the y-intercept, negative 12 point something, and b, 0.59. And here's a graph of the data. And I've, I've got some things colored in green and red, like treatment professional, yes, and treatment professional, no. But, but the line is for everybody. First of all, you can see we have some problems with variability along the line. Right, right here, there's a lot of variability. And then up here, there's not very much. And up here, there's not very much. So we might have problems with consistent variability along the length of the line. Uh, but let's just assume everything's OK. Where's the y-intercept? You might say, oh, you have to go down to this line. But now that line is just where the graph decided to put things. Where's zero? That's the question. Zero is the y-intercept. Here's the zero line. Zero is the middle in this case. And the y-intercept is negative 12.25. So yeah, about there. This is about halfway between zero and negative 25. We can see there it's a negative 12-ish. So that's the y-intercept. So in this case, the y-intercept tells us the it tells us the religious fundamentalism score we would predict for a person whose right wing authoritarian attitudes were always neutral that were on average this person answered neutral all their positives canceled out their negatives or they just said neutral 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 all the way through the questionnaire is that useful i don't know it depends on your research question maybe but it's a it's a bit weird so here's another example it's fake but it's based on some real data that i saw this one time pretty flaky that you can do that when you're a professor but here i am what if corruption of a country was measured on a scale with extremely corrupt nations scored below zero and um, non-corrupt nations scored above zero? Then where would the intercept be? Oops. Why don't I have... Hang on just a second. This is giving me some fits. Oh, I guess this is just a weird slide. So um, here's a graph of that. So what does the zero mean now? Well, now the zero in this regression equation, if we calculate a regression equation, whatever the, the y-intercept is, is going to indicate the point where zero happens, the point where there's no corruption. So the y-intercept is actually going to be the high end on this particular graph, just because this data set was already pre-selected to include only nations with like a lot of corruption. 